Oh, nerds, nerds, nerds. Hello, this is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am that woman, that host of yours, she who loves this shit, Liv. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, it's Tuesday, why am I listening to a reading episode? Well, I promise I've got a good answer for you. While you listen to this reading episode, which, by the way, is so worth it for a Tuesday because this shit is wild, I will be visiting the Greek island of Samothrace. This is, to say this is a dream of mine is like a complete understatement. It doesn't even begin to describe how I feel about being able to visit Samothrace. Which leads me to, very quickly, this was recorded far, far in what is now the past. Back in February, actually, so if the world has changed and is even more on fire than it is right now, then I'm sorry that I'm not addressing it. I am, much to my own chagrin slash, let's be honest, it's definitely for the best, I am not the goddess of foresight, famous. So, why Samothrace? Why should you, my listeners, care that I am on this island of Samothrace? Well, let me tell you. Samothrace is a tiny island in the furthest northeastern reaches of the Greek island, so close to Turkey and the northern edge of Greece. It is tiny. And one would think, and it certainly was for a time, that is fairly inconsequential. I mean, there are so many Greek islands. How does one keep track? But Samothrace, you see, is a mythological birthplace or mythological home of my girl, my favorite mythological character that isn't Medusa, Harmonia. Samothrace is also the home of the Samothracian Mysteries, the second most important mystery cult of ancient Greece. You might know it, though, as the home of Winged Victory, the incredible Hellenistic statue now housed in the Louvre of a headless and armless goddess Nike and her stunning and detailed feathered wings. This was found in Samothrace, at the site of the ancient sanctuary where the mysteries took place. <laughs> So I'm visiting to see it all and to write my novel and to just take in the history, but I'm going to share it with you too. I don't know how or when yet I'm taking that time off so that I'm just writing the book, but I will share some things with you about this interesting island that so few people know anything about save for Winged Victory. But in the meantime, listen to this reading episode and know that you have it because I'm finally, finally in the right place to finish my writing my fucking novel. Hopefully. Fuck, I better finish it. Or rather, finish a draft worthy of human consumption. Fingers crossed, right? Now, Lucian. Who was Lucian? Is it Lucian? We're going with Lucian. This is a new name for you listeners. I haven't referenced him before, nor have I used him as a source as far as I know. And that is because, well, his work is unique. Lucian was a Greek author of the Roman period, but he was from Roman Syria, but modern Turkey. Yeah, make that make sense. But still, it does. He wrote in Greek. He was from regions that were taken over by the Greeks before they were taken over by the Romans. Imperialism, right? Lucian lived in the 2nd century AD, where he wrote, well, satire. But specifically, sarcastic satire. I don't typically use Wikipedia for anything, I promise. But there's a line about Lucian that's too good not to share. I'm using it now just to get an idea of him so I can share it with you before I read this. And this sums him up pretty well. Quote, Everything that is known about Lucian's life comes from his own writings, which are often difficult to interpret because of his extensive use of sarcasm. Truly, a man after my own heart. Lucian's most famous work is what I'm reading today. The True History, or The True Story, which is something else. It's a satire, but it's a satire of, like, well, my whole podcast? Okay, not really. But it is a satire of the world Lucian comes from and the mythological works treated as history. He was having fun with the popular writers of the time and the historical writers, presenting something basically just making fun of mythology, history, everything. And I'm so here for it. It is also sometimes referred to as the first science fiction because it's satire, I would say that Queen Mary Shelley still holds that title, but Lucian's does get special credit for satirically and sarcastically introducing the idea of space travel. Yep, you heard me. Space travel. This 
is Lucian's True History, translated by Francis Hicks, Part 1. Even as champions and wrestlers and such as practice the strength and agility of body are not only careful to retain a sound constitution of health and to hold on their ordinary course of exercise, but sometimes also to recreate themselves with seasonable intermission, and esteem it is main point of their practice. So I think it necessary for scholars and such as addict themselves to the study of learning after they have travelled long in the perusal of serious authors, to relax a little the intention of their thoughts, that they might be more apt and able to endure a continued course of study. And this kind of repose will be the more conformable and fit their purpose better, if it be employed in the reading of such works as shall not only yield a bare content by the pleasing and comely composure of them, but shall also give occasion of some learned speculation to the mind, which I suppose I have effected in these books of mine, wherein not only the novelty of the subject nor the pleasingness of the project may tickle the reader with delight, nor to hear so many notorious lies delivered persuasively and in the way of truth, but because everything here by me set down doth in a comical fashion glance at some or other of the old poets, historiographers, and philosophers, which, in their writing, have recorded many monstrous and intolerable untruths, whose names I would have quoted down, but that I knew the reading would betray them to you. Ctesius, the son of Ctesiochus, the Canidian, wrote of the region of the Indians and the state of those countries, matters which he neither saw himself nor ever heard come from the mouth of any man. Iambulus also wrote many strange miracles of the great sea, which all men knew to be lies and fictions, yet so composed that they want not their delight. And many others have made choice of the like argument, of which some have published their own travels and peregrinations, wherein they have described the greatness of beasts, the fierce condition of men, with their strange and uncouth manner of life, but the first father and founder of all this foolery was Homer's Odysseus, who tells a long tale to Alcanus of the servitude of the winds and of wild men with one eye in their foreheads that fed upon raw flesh, of beasts with many heads, and the transformation of his friends by enchanted potions, all which he made the silly Phaeacians believe for great sooth. This coming to my perusal, I could not condemn ordinary men for lying, when I saw it in request amongst them that would be counted philosophical persons. Yet could not but wonder at them, that, writing so manifest lies, they should not think to be taken with the manner. And this made me also ambitious to leave some monument of myself behind me, that I might not be the only man exempted from this liberty of lying." And because I had no matter of verity to employ my pen in, for nothing hath befallen me worth the writing, I turned my style to publish untruths, but with an honester mind than others have done. For this one thing I confidently pronounce for a truth, that I lie. And this, I hope, may be an excuse for all the rest, when I confess what I am faulty in. For I write of matters which I neither saw nor suffered nor heard by report from others, which are in no being, nor possible ever to have a beginning. Let no man, therefore, in any case, give any credit to them. Disanchoring on a time from the pillars of Hercules, the wind fitting me well for my purpose, I thrust into the West Ocean. The occasion that moved me to take such a voyage in hand was only a curiosity of mind, a desire of novelties, and a longing to learn out the bounds of the ocean, and what people inhabit the farther shore, for which purpose I made plentiful provision of victuals and fresh water, got fifty companions of the same humor to associate me in my travels, furnished myself with store of munition, gave a round sum of money to an expert pilot that could direct us in our course, and new rigged and repaired a tall ship strongly to hold a tedious and difficult journey. 
Thus sailed we forward a day and a night with a prosperous wind, and as long as we had any sight of land, made no great haste on our way. But the next morrow about sun rising the wind blew high and the waves began to swell, and a darkness fell upon us, so that we could not see to strike our sails, but gave our ship over to the wind and weather. Thus were we tossed in this tempest the space of three score and nineteen days together. On the fourscore day the sun upon a sudden break out, and we saw not far off us an island full of mountains and woods, about the which the seas did not rage so boisterously, for the storm was now reasonably well calmed. There we thrust in and went on shore and cast ourselves upon the ground, and so lay a long time, as utterly tired with our misery at sea. In the end we arose and divided ourselves. Thirty we left to guard our ship, myself and twenty more went to discover the island, and had not gone about three furlongs from the sea through a wood, but we saw a brazen pillar erected, whereupon Greek letters were engraven, though now much worn and hard to be discerned, importing, Thus far travelled Hercules and Bacchus. There were also near unto the place two portraitures cut out in a rock, the one of the quantity of an acre of ground, the other less, which made me imagine the lesser to be Bacchus and the other Hercules, and giving them due adoration we proceeded on our journey. And far we had not gone, but we came to a river, the stream whereof seemed to run with as rich wine as any is made in Chios, and of a great breadth, in some places able to bear a ship, which made me to give more credit to the inscription upon the pillar, which I saw such apparent signs of Bacchus's peregrination. We then resolved to travel up the stream to find whence the river had his original, and when we were come to the head, no spring at all appeared, but mighty great vine trees of infinite number, which from their roots distilled pure wine, which made the river run so abundantly. The stream was also well stored with fish, of which we took a few, in taste and color much resembling wine, but as many as eight of them fell drunk upon it. For when they were opened and cut up, we found them to be full of lees. Afterwards we mixed some fresh water fish with them, which allayed the strong taste of the wine. We then crossed the stream, where we found it passable, and came among a world of vines of incredible number, which towards the earth had firm stalks and of good growth, but the tops of them were women, from the hip upwards having all their proportion perfect and complete, as painters paint out Daphne, who was turned into a tree when she was overtaken by Apollo. At their fingers' ends sprung out branches full of grapes, and the hair of their heads was nothing else but winding wires and leaves and clusters of grapes. When we were come to them, they saluted us and joined hands with us, and spoke unto us in some the Lydian and some in the Indian language, but most of them in Greek. They also kissed us with their mouths, but he that was so kissed fell drunk, and was not his own man a good while after. They could not abide to have any fruit pulled from them, but would roar and cry out pitifully if any man offered it. Some of them desired to have carnal mixture with us, and two of our company were so bold as to entertain their offer, and could never afterwards be loosed from them but were knit fast together at their nether parts, from whence they grew together and took root together, and their fingers began to sprout out with branches and crooked wires, as if they were ready to bring out fruit. Whereupon we forsook them and fled to our ships, and told the company at our coming what we had seen, how our fellows were entangled, and of their copulation with the vines. Then we took certain of our vessels and filled them, some with water and some with wine, out of the river, and lodged for that night near the shore. On the morrow we put out to sea again, the wind serving us weakly, 
But about noon, when we had lost sight of the island, upon a sudden whirlwind caught us, which turned our ship round about and lifted us up some three thousand furlongs into the air and suffered us not to settle again into the sea. But we hung above ground and were carried aloft with a mighty wind which filled our sails strongly. Thus for seven days' space and so many nights were we driven along in that matter, and on the eighth day we came in view of a great country in the air, like to a shining island, of a round proportion, gloriously glittering with light. And approaching it, we there arrived, and took land, and surveying the country, we found it to be both inhabited and husbanded, and as long as the day lasted we could see nothing there. But when night was come, many other islands appeared unto us, some greater and some less, all of the color of fire, and another kind of earth underneath, in which were cities and seas and rivers and woods and mountains, which we conjectured to be the earth by us inhabited. And going further into the land, we were met with all and taken by those kind of people which they called Hippogippians. These Hippogippians are men riding upon monstrous vultures, which they use instead of horses. For the vultures are exceedingly great, every one with three heads apiece. You may imagine their greatness by this. For every feather in their wings was bigger and longer than the mast of a tall ship. Their charge was to fly about the country, and all the strangers they found to bring them to the king. And their fortune was then to seize upon us, and by them we were presented to him. As soon as he saw us, he conjectured by our habit what countrymen we were, and said, Are not you, strangers, Grecians? Which, when we affirmed, and how could you make way, said he, through so much air as to get here? Then we delivered the whole discourse of our fortunes to him, whereupon he began to tell us likewise of his own adventures, how that he was also a man, by name Endymion, and wrapped up long since from the earth as he was asleep, and brought hither, where he was made king of the country, and said it was that region which to us below seemed to be the moon. But he bade us be of good cheer and fear no danger, for we should want nothing we stood in need of. And if the war he was now in hand withal against the sun succeeded fortunately, we should live with him in the highest degrees of happiness. Then we asked of him what enemies he had and the cause of the quarrel. And he answered, Phaethon, the king of the inhabitants of the sun, for that is also peopled as well as the moon, hath made war against us a long time upon this occasion. I once assembled all the poor people and needy persons within my dominions, purposing to send a colony to inhabit the Morning Star, because the country was deserted and had nobody dwelling in it. This Phaethon envied, crossed me in my design, and sent his Hippomermix to meet with us in the midway, by whom we were surprised at that time, being not prepared for an encounter, and were forced to retire. Now, therefore, my purpose is once again to denounce war and publish a plantation of people there. If, therefore, you will participate with us in our expedition, I will furnish you every one with a prime vulture and all armor answerable for service, for tomorrow we must set forwards. With all our hearts, said I, if it please you. Then were we feasted and abode with him, and in the morning arose to set ourselves in order of battle, for our scouts had given us knowledge that the enemy was at hand. Forces in number amounted to a hundred thousand, besides such as bear burthens and engineers and the foot forces and the strange aids, 
Of these, fourscore thousand were Hippogippians, and twenty thousand that rode upon Lacanopters, which is a mighty great fowl, and instead of feathers covered thick over with wart leaves, but their wing feathers were much like the leaves of lettuces. After them were placed the Kencrobolians and the Scorodomachians. There came also to aid us with the bear star 30,000 Psilotoxotans and 50,000 Animadromians. These Psilotoxotans ride upon great fleas, of which they have their denomination, for every flea among them is as big as a dozen elephants. The Animadromians are footmen, yet flew in the air without feathers in this manner. Every man had a large mantle reaching down to his foot, which the wind blowing against filled it like a sail, and they were carried along as if they had been boats. The most part of these in flight were targeteers. It was said also that there were expected from the stars over Cappadocia threescore and ten thousand Struthobalanians and five thousand Hippogranians, but I had no sight of them, for they were not yet come, and therefore I didn't write anything, though wonderful and incredible reports were given of them. This was the number of Endymion's army. The furniture was all alike, their helmets of bean hulls, which are great with them, and very strong, their breastplates all of lupins cut into scales, for they take the shells of lupins, and, fastening them together, make breastplates of them which are impenetrable and as hard as any horn. Their shields and swords, like to ours in Greece, and when the time of battle was come, they were ordered in this manner. The right wing was supplied by the Hippogippians, where the king himself was in person with the choicest soldiers in the army, among whom we also were ranged. The Glacanopters made the left wing, and the aides were placed in the main battle as every man's fortune fell. The foot, which in number were about six thousand myriads, were disposed of in this manner. There are many spiders in those parts of mighty bigness every one in quantity exceeding of the islands of the Cyclades. These were appointed to spin a web in the air between the moon and the morning star, which was done in an instant, and made a plain bridge upon which the foot forces were planted, who had for their leader Nycterion, the son of Eudianax, and two other associates. But of the enemy's side, the left wing consisted of the Hippomermix, and among them Phaethon himself. These are beasts of huge bigness, and winged carrying the resemblance of our emmets. But for their greatness, for those of the largest size, were of the quantity of two acres. And not only the riders supplied the place of soldiers, but they also did much mischief with their horns. They were in number fifty thousand. In the right wing were ranged the Aeroconopes, of which there were about fifty thousand, all archers riding upon great gnats. Then followed the Aerocardaces, who were light-armed and footmen, but good soldiers, casting out slings afar off huge great turnips. And whosoever was hit with them lived not long after, but died with the stink that proceeded from their wounds. It is said they used to anoint their bullets with the poison of mallows. After them were placed the Colomicates, men-at-arms and good-at-hand strokes, in number about 50,000. They are called Colomicates because their shields were made of mushrooms and their spears of the stalks of the herb asparagus. Near unto them were placed the Kynobalanians that were sent from the dog star to aid him. These were men with dogs' faces, riding upon winged acorns. But the slingers that should have come out of Via Lactea and the Nephilocentors came too short of these aids, for the battle was done before their arrival, so that they did them no good, and indeed the slingers came not at all, wherefore, they say, Phaethon, in displeasure, overran their country. These were all the forces that Phaethon brought into the field, and when they were joined in battle, after the signal was given, and when the asses on either side had brayed, for these are to them instead of trumpets, 
The fight began, and the left wing of the Heliotans, or Sun Soldiers, fled presently and would not abide to receive the charge of the Hippogypians, but turned their backs immediately, and many were put to the sword. But the right wing of theirs were too hard by our left wing, and drove them back till they came to our footmen, who, joining with them, made the enemies there also turn their backs and fly, especially when they found their own left wing to be overthrown. Thus were they wholly discomfited on all hands. Many were taken prisoners, and many slain. Much blood was spilt. Some fell upon the clouds, which made them look of a red color, as sometimes they appear to us about sunsetting. Some dropped upon the earth, which made me suppose it was upon some such occasion that Homer thought Jupiter rained blood for the death of his son Sarpedon. Returning from the pursuit, we erected two trophies— one for the fight on foot, which we placed upon the spider's webs, the other for the fight in the air, which we set upon the clouds. As soon as this was done, news came to us by our scouts that the Nephilicentors were coming on, which indeed should have come to Phaethon before the fight. And when they drew so near unto us that we could take full view of them, it was a strange sight to behold such monsters, composed of flying horses and men, that part which resembled mankind, which was from the waist upwards, did equal in greatness the Rhodian Colossus, and that which was like a horse was as big as a great ship of burden, and of such a multitude that I was fearful to set down their number, lest it might be taken for a lie. And for their leader, they had the Sagittarius out of the Zodiac. When they heard that their friends were foiled, they sent a messenger to Phaethon to renew the fight, Whereupon they set themselves in array, and fell upon the Selenitans, or the moon soldiers, that were troubled, and disordered into following the chase, and scattered in gathering the spoils, and put them all in flight, and pursued the king into his city, and killed the greatest part of his birds, overturned the trophies he had set up, and overcame the whole country that was spun by the spiders. Myself and... Two other companions were taken alive. When Phaethon himself was come, they set up other trophies in token of victory, and on the morrow we were carried prisoners into the sun. Our arms bound behind us with a piece of the cobweb, yet would they by no means lay any siege to the city, but returned and built up a wall in the midst of the air to keep the light of the sun from falling upon the moon and they made it a double wall, wholly compact of clouds, so that a manifest eclipse of the moon ensued, and all things detained in perpetual night. Wherewith Endymion was so much oppressed that he sent ambassadors to entreat the demolishing of the building, and beseech him that he would not damn them to live in darkness, promising to pay him tribute, to be his friend and associate, and never after to stir against him. Phaethon's council twice assembled to consider upon this offer, and in their first meeting would remit nothing of their conceived displeasure, but on the morrow they altered their minds to these terms. The Heliotans and their colleagues have made a peace with the Selenitans, and their associates upon these conditions— that the Heliotans shall cast down the wall, and deliver the prisoners that they have taken upon a rateable ransom, and that the Selenitans sh should leave the other stars at liberty, and raise no war against the Heliotans, but aid and assist one another if either of them should be invaded, that the king of the Selenitans should yearly pay to the king of the Heliotans, in way of tribute, ten thousand vessels of dew, and deliver ten thousand of their people to be pledges for their fidelity, that the colony to be sent to the Morning Star should be jointly supplied by them both, and liberty given to any else that would be the sharers in it, that these articles of peace should be engraven in a pillar of amber, to be erected in the midst of the air upon the confines of their country, for the performance whereof were sworn the Heliotans, Pyronides, and Therites, and Phlogius, and of the Selenitans, Nyctor, and Menius, and Polylampes. Thus was the peace concluded, the wall immediately demolished, and we that were prisoners delivered. 
Being returned into the moon, they came forth to meet us, and Dimion himself and all his friends, who embraced us with tears and desired us to make our abode with him and to be partners in the colony, promising to give me his own son in marriage, for there are no women amongst them, which I by no means would yield unto, but desired of all loves to be dismissed again into the sea. And he, finding it impossible to persuade us to his purpose, after seven days feasting, gave us leave to depart. Now, what strange novelties worthy of note I observed during the time of my abode there, I will relate unto you. The first is that they are not begotten of women, but of mankind, for they have no other marriage but of males. The name of women is utterly unknown among them. Until they accomplish the age of five and twenty years, they are given in marriage to others. From that time forwards, they take others in marriage to themselves. For as soon as the infant is conceived, the leg begins to swell. And afterwards, when the time of birth is come, they give it a lance and take it out dead. Then they lay it abroad with open mouth toward the wind, and so it takes life. And I think thereof the Grecians call it the belly of the leg, because therein they bear their children instead of a belly. I will tell you now of a thing more strange than this. There are a kind of men among them called the Dendritans, which are begotten in this manner. They cut out the right stone of a man's cod and set it in the ground, from which springeth up a great tree of flesh, with branches and leaves, bearing a kind of fruit, much like to an acorn, but of a cubit in length, which they gather when they are ripe and cut men out of them. Their privy members are to be set on and taken off as they have occasion. Rich men have them made of ivory, poor men of wood, wherewith they perform the act of generation and accompany their spouses. When a man is come to his full age, he dies not, but is dissolved like smoke, and is turned into air. One kind of food is common to them all, for they kindle a fire and broil frogs upon the coals, which are with them in infinite numbers, flying in the air, and whilst they're boiling, they sit round about them as if it were about a table, and lap up the smoke that rises from them and feast themselves therewith, and this is all their feeding. For their drink they have air beaten into a mortar, which yields a kind of moisture much like unto dew. They have no avoidance of excrements, either of urine or dung, neither have they any issue for that purpose like unto us. Their boys admit copulation, but not like unto ours, but in their hams, a little above the calf of the leg, for they are open for there they are open. They hold it a great ornament to be bald, for hairy persons are abhorred with them, and yet among the stars that are comets it is thought commendable, as some that have travelled those coasts reported unto us. Such beards as they have are growing a little above their knees. They have no nails on their feet, for their whole foot is all but one toe." Every one of them is at the point of his rump hath a long colwort growing out instead of a tail, always green and flourishing, which, though a man fall upon his back, cannot be broken. The droppings of their noses is more sweet than honey. When they labor or exercise themselves, they anoint their body with milk, wherein too if a little of that honey chance to drop, it will be turned into cheese. They make very fat oil of their beans, and of a delicate a savour as any sweet ointment. They have many vines in those parts, which yield but water, for the grapes that hang upon the clusters are like our hailstones. And I verily think that when the wines there are shaken with a strong wind, there falls a storm of hail among, amongst us by the breaking down of those kinds of berries. Their bellies stand them instead of satchels to put in their necessities, which they may open and shut at their pleasure, for they have neither liver nor any kind of entrails, only they are rough and hairy within, so that when their young children are cold, they may be enclosed therein to keep them warm. 
The rich men have garments of glass, very soft and delicate, the poorer sort of brass woven, whereof they have great plenty, which they enseam with water to make it fit for the workmen, as we do our wool. If I should write what manner of eyes they have, I doubt I should be taken for a liar in publishing a matter so incredible, yet I cannot choose but tell it, for they have eyes to take in and out as please themselves, and when a man is so disposed, he may take them out and lay them by till he has occasion to use them, and then put them in and see again. Many when they have lost their own eyes, borrow of others, for the rich have many lying by them. Their ears are all made of the leaves of plane trees, excepting those that come of acorns, for they only have them made of wood. I saw also another strange thing in the same court, a mighty great glass lying upon the top of a pit of no great depth, whereinto, if any man descend, he shall hear everything that is spoken upon the earth. If he but look into the glass, he shall see all cities and all nations as well as if he were among them. There had I the sight of all my friends and the whole country about. Whether they saw me or not, I cannot tell, but if they believe it not to be so, let them take the pains to go thither themselves, and they shall find my words true. Oh my gods? Oh my gods? Can you believe this was written in the second century CE? Like, this shit is wild. It's ridiculous. I knew it was going to be, and yet, my mind has still been blown. Huge thanks to Ryan Denson, a, a recent guest on the podcast. I forget when the episode is scheduled to come out. Maybe an upcoming guest or very recent. Hard to say. But thank you to Ryan for suggesting this because game changer. Where did Lucian come up with this stuff? People? I mean, are they people? Moon people? Sun people? They're riding flying acorns. There was a river of wine. If you don't think that sold me immediately, you don't know me well enough. This work is so much fun to read. I mean, I say this all the time because it's all fun, but like, fuck if this one isn't something else entirely. I cannot wait for next episode. I mean, I've only read a third of this book and we've already had rivers of wine, tree women who meld to men, they fuck and then keep them like that forever. A trip to the moon where all the absolutely most bananas shit goes down. You know, just a war between the sun and the moon. No big. Also, those names. So, Phaethon, obviously, right, is the son of Helios, who fucks shit up. And Dimion is the lover of Selene, the moon goddess. Like, these are so good. Totally normal stuff for the second century. I'm living for it. Cannot wait. Just assuming you're all going to feel the same way, because literally, how could you not? This man is intentionally making up the silliest, most ridiculous stuff that he could imagine, specifically to make fun of historiographers and mythographers of his time and earlier, and specifically, like he said at the beginning, truly just to spite Homer for making the Odyssey so fucked up. <sighs> Let's Talk About Myths Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Michaela Smith handles so many incredible and wonderful things, including promotional material, my YouTube, research. The podcast is hosted and monetized by the fine non-moon people at ACAST. I am Liv, and I love ancient authors so much they can be so weird and wonderful. <laughs> I love this shit. <laughs>